Hi, I'm James Brown, Chief Engineer at Custom Amplification, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about how we go about achieving the perfect guitar tone. Um, I started playing music when I was about 10 years old, playing keyboards, uh, learned trumpet in school, and uh, when I was about 14, uh, my uncle taught me how to play guitar, and that's when I took off on the guitar. And uh, at the time, I was listening to a lot of different bands, probably was really into Beatles and Pink Floyd, and um, probably my biggest influences were Kiss and ZZ Top, and uh, a lot of the guitar sounds I, I probably look for lean toward that sort of thing. At the same time, about 78, when Van Halen hit, there was a whole new sound that kind of came out, and it had a lot of influence on me as well, so I end up with quite a variety of uh, musical interest, I guess. My first musical memories probably w weren't very pleasant. We had a piano, an upright piano in our house, and my sisters were forced to take lessons and hated it. So I didn't think music, playing music was fun. Uh, my mom played classical music when she vacuumed. And I had, and I, I learned to like certain music, classical pieces. Um, maybe not classical, I mean 20th century stuff. Uh, Gershwin, she loved Gershwin. So I heard L Lenny Bernstein and the New York Philharmonic playing An American in Paris and uh, Rhapsody in Blue many times. And I think that's the first time I remember like really liking music, other than pop songs that were silly for being a little kid. Well, I'm 52, and somewhere in the late 50s, I remember my dad and, and uncles playing music around the house, and uh, my grandfather playing. Uh, a little bit later on, uh, being able to play a little bit and set in with them. And uh, that was just, uh, they were just larger than life to me. I mean, they, you know, my dad's gone now, my uncle's still alive, and they, they Dillard and uh, and Willard, they still play great. Steel guitar, lead guitar, and uh, the whole thing. And uh, my grandfather was an interesting guy. He uh, he played Carnegie Hall in the late 70s. And uh, hammer uh, banjo style playing, old folk style. And uh, played the World's Fair and everything. So what was cool about him is in the 70s, or late 60s, when I was able to play you know, a little of the Chet style and Merle stuff, that uh, we'd play for like uh, uh, fish fries and stuff, and they'd be dancing, and a few people drinking and stuff, and uh, and uh, just to see the people respond to that was just overwhelming, you know. So that was some of my earlier remembrances. Was my family would be my my biggest musical influences. After that would probably be uh, Chet Atkins, uh, Merle Travis, uh, some of the, the finger style players. And what I liked also was uh, you heard r excellent music like on uh, the old shows, Perry Mason, stuff like that. Somebody would just be playing real dark sounding chords, you know, you could hear something held in suspense there, you know. So I like to fuse those styles together and uh, early 60s, guys like Lonnie Mack was just busting through the radio. And by the time the Beatles came out, I was I was 10 years old, 64. I was able to play probably most of the stuff that they were doing at that early time frame. And uh, I didn't see all the hoopla about the Beatles, to be honest with you, after hearing, the, hearing the Lonnie Mack and uh, Buck Owens, and them guys were great musicians, Chet. But I grew to really like the Beatles after they matured as uh, songwriters and stuff. At that time is probably when I decided that uh, since I grew up in Mississippi, I listened to a lot of Mississippi music. One of, one of my favorite bands at that time was uh, Leonard Skinner. They were using PV. That was really the reason why I started using it in the first place. And so I basically went back to college with the plan of working there once I finished. And uh, after, two, after I finished college, uh, I actually taught at USM, Southern Miss, for about two years, and then I got a job at PV designing guitar amps. And uh, at the time, 
they, you, didn't, you couldn't learn much about tubes in school, but uh, I learned a lot from Hartley and also uh, my main mentor at PV was a guy named Jack Sondermeyer, who was pretty much a, an engineering genius. And uh, he taught me everything I needed to know about tubes. And then the things I needed to know about guitar tone, I learned as I went by trying different things and experimenting with other amps uh, to figure out what it was I was missing all those years when I, when I was playing through what I'd call regular amps. We're here in the studio today and uh, I brought my friends Scotty Anderson, Rob Fetters. They're gonna help me demonstrate the difference in power levels and some other things about the coupe amplifiers from Custom. Um, this amp is a 36 coupe, which is 36 watts. And this amp is a 72 coupe, which is 72 watts. So the point here is to demonstrate how the differences in power can impact the tone of the guitar amp. Okay. First, I'll get Rob to play something through the 36 coupe so you can hear how, how that works. Six watts, and now here's a 72 coupe, which is 72 watts. Probably the biggest difference you notice between the two power amps or between the two sized amps is with the 36 it's a little bit easier to break up beat on it just a little bit more there beat on the guitar beat on it a little bit. okay whereas on the 72 coupe when you do the same kind of thing it's, it's got a lot more So the, diff the biggest difference would be how clean the thing plays. Uh, when, you're, when you've got the more power, the clean sound is a lot pingier. It's got a lot more attack. On the smaller amp, the clean sound is a little bit grindier and has a little bit more of a bluesy expression to it. first amp I worked on was called the VTM and it was kind of neat for the time because it was a it, it stood for vacuum tube modified and what it was there was a lot of amps being modified especially out on the west coast and uh, people were paying four or five hundred dollars just to have their Marshall modified with more gain different tone settings things like this and so what we did we had the idea why don't we build an amp that's already modified but we'll put switches on the front so people can dial that mod in themselves, kind of put it back in the hands of the consumer. And it worked really well. And uh, as a result, you know, that amp kind of sprung, sprung us into a whole line of tube products. Um, shortly after that, about 90, 91, I did the Classic Series uh, with a lot of help from Hartley. And uh, that series was the one that pretty much gave us our sound. And coming up with a, a signature sound to me is very important at any company I'm, I'm with. Um, it's always a search for guitar tone that progresses. Each year I'm trying to make what I did last year sound bad, basically. And uh, at this point, we've, we've pretty much established a sound. Uh, a year or so later, I, I got the opportunity to work with Eddie Van Halen on the 5150, 
which was a very important project for me. And uh, I learned a lot from him and vice versa. Um, later, uh, I, after going through several other solid state amps, a lot of different kinds of things, steel guitar amps, um, eventually I did the Triple X and the JSX, which is Joe Satriani's signature model. And uh, at that point, I was starting to feel a little bit repetitive in what I was working on. And I got an opportunity to come to Custom here in Cincinnati, which I felt like was a good opportunity to work for a smaller company, maybe move a little bit quicker, do some more creative parts of the job rather than uh, mostly focusing on the engineering aspects. So I've gotten to do a lot of things that have to do with cosmetics and uh, actual design. For instance, the coupe is a, is a cosmetic direction that I came up with to try to come up with some, a way to tie the past into the modern looks of amps. Well, music became interesting for me like a million other people when I saw the Beatles, when I saw what to me at the time were adults having fun at jobs. So the Beatles, of course, and uh, as soon as I saw them, there was a, I, I basically stole my sister Wendy's guitar. She had a uh, Stella striped acoustic, probably cost 30 bucks, and uh, learned from a next door neighbor a couple of chords. Really got into it and uh, I just loved, I loved playing guitar. My dad took me to see Jimi Hendrix. Uh, actually, in one week, I saw a classical guitarist named Miguel Rubeo, who was a Segovia, Segovia uh, protege. I saw him play on like a Tuesday night. My mom took me to that recital, and I, was, I thought, that's where I want to go. Friday night of the same week, my dad took me to see Jimi Hendrix and the experience play with Soft Machine. And that, it was all like all bets were off. Suddenly I just saw a whole new world and uh, still to this day I can remember what it felt like to, uh, it was a religious experience for me to hear just that feedback note, Foxy Lady. I was probably a quarter mile away from Jimi Hendrix and just a spotlight on him starting with a feedback note that started from silence to something that I thought was going to kill me, it was so loud. And, and all his, everything he did just turned me completely around and I that was when I probably started playing guitar about six hours a day every waking moment <laughs> I like Chet's style with this uh, real clean sound and maybe a mixture of uh, some jazz type overtones. Say for instance if I played uh, a thumb style song or something, you know, the Chet sound, then I might want to uh, get a little radical. Maybe get back into a jazz thing. Preamp tubes, power tubes, and rectifier tubes impact the tone in a lot of different ways, uh, mostly in how they distort, but also the fact that they amplify non-linearly in the first place, which means that small signals don't get amplified exactly the same as large signals. 
um, or you can think of it as the louder you play, the, the uh, amp's response actually changes. And, uh, and this is not just magic, it's measurably different. It's, it's uh, you know, you can look at it on a scope and tell that it's different. Um, Preamp tubes work in an asymmetrical way, which means that they clip, when they do distort, they clip the one side of the waveform more than the other, positive or negative. And in doing so, you, it ends up creating more even harmonics than odd harmonics. The reason that's important is because even harmonics are octaves, so they're always musically correct. Whereas odd harmonics tend to be less musical sounding when they're blended with the notes that you're actually playing. So that's kind of an important aspect about preamp distortion. Uh, it's also a little bit more like using pedals in front of the amp because you're overdriving the, the earliest stage. This is how you get a low volume distortion tone is by using either input pedals that overdrive the amp or a lot of gain in the preamp stages. Okay, power tubes, when a power tube breaks up, it's a little bit more like a hard limit. When you turn your guitar down, it gets very clean. You turn your guitar up, you hear it hitting that limit. The most important difference in preamp and power amp is the fact that a power amp, if it's a class AB, for instance, will be symmetrically clipped. So it'll generate odd and even harmonics, which has a different sound to it. It can sound non-musical sometimes, so it only works with certain kinds of things that you would play. It might not sound good with a chord because there's so many notes that you're changing the, the harmonic content of, but it works well with solos where you're playing single notes a lot of times. Um, and then the other thing that's great about power amp clipping is you can turn your guitar down if you're playing pretty clean through the preamp and you'll get a very clean kind of singing clean sound without having to resort to a channel switch, you know, to another sound. Um, tube rectifiers create a situation that we call power amp sag. And what that is, it's a way that instead of the amp having the same amount of power all the time, it basically responds differently when you first whack the guitar string basically it would be a lot louder power and then after you sustain something it'll squash down to some lower amount of power and that's because the rectifier tube is inherently lossy and as you draw current through it it loads the signal down it drops the voltage it's kind of like variacking the amp down every, every time you hit the guitar it variacks the amp down a little bit so you get a little less power on a sustained fashion okay uh, we want to talk a little bit about how the preamp distortion and power amp distortion works. On, I'm using the 36 coupe so it won't be so loud when we get to the power amp distortion part, but here's the preamp distortion which you achieve by turning the input volume up and the master volume down lower. And, uh, and uh, Rob's going to demonstrate how the amp sounds both when you're, when you're really beating on it and when you clean the guitar up so you can see how that changes. Okay, so that's, that demonstrates what preamp distortion sounds like, and you notice when he cleaned the guitar up at the beginning, it's still pretty chunky. It's not really what you'd call clean, it's a chunkier overdrive kind of sound. Now, now I want to go for the opposite, which would be more power amp distortion. Turn the input volume down and the master all the way up, and now when you play it, you get a completely different effect. Sure. All right, but when you clean it up, so in this case, it's a lot cleaner sounding when you clean the guitar up. 
for how dirty it sounds when you're playing it full on. <laughs> talk about the various aspects of a good guitar tone or a good amp design, uh, there's several things that come to mind to me. One is to make sure that it has a consistent tone, meaning that when you build a whole line of amps, it's easy to make one amp sound good. What's hard is to make a hundred amps sound the same once you make the one that sounds good. So I always try to use techniques in the design and in the manufacturing of an amp that will help facilitate that so that every amp sounds the same. Because I don't want to worry about if a guy walks in a store and plays one and he thinks it sounds bad just because somebody put a wire in the wrong place when they manufactured it. Another aspect would be reliability. Uh, obviously, none of us want to get at a gig and have an amp shut down in the middle of a song, especially a solo. So. It's, uh, it's important to have an amp that you can count on. It has to sound good, but it also has to be reliable. And sometimes we make trade-offs to try to facilitate that. Um, um, another aspect would be, it's very important to me that a person can walk up to an amp I designed, plug in, and easily get a good sound. Uh, there's a lot of amps that you can find a good sound if you spend a lot of time with the knobs turning knobs different ways and trying different guitar combinations and finally you'll reach that one spot. I prefer the approach where you plug into an amp and regardless of how you play or what kind of guitar you use or where you set the knobs, you can pretty much get a good tone because that way you can move from worrying about whether the amp sounds good to making music with it, which is really the ultimate goal of this. I think I'm a Jeff Beck wannabe, so I hear my stuff and I, I hear, I, I can hear exactly where I'm coming from. I, I don't really hear much Hendrix. I, I can hear myself sounding a little bit like Leslie West sometimes, uh, David Gilmore, all those uh, British guys. The other thing I have is uh, a teenage uh, when I was a teenager, I went to Detroit all the time. I lived and breathed the Stooges, early punk bands like that, proto-punk bands. I saw the MC5, uh, Ted Nugent with a Birdland, a jazz box guitar, bending the neck for his, for his twang bar effects, things like that. So I really uh, saw that kind of animalistic, brutal approach to playing guitar. And I, I hear that in Hendrix and, and Jeff Beck, and I hear that with Adrian and other guitar players I like. So I really like, I liked that range. And how do I hear my, I, I don't know. I, I try to play like a lot of different styles. And I, and I like guys like Amos Garrett. I, I like Pickers, uh, God, Scotty. I, I can't imagine playing like that. I don't need to. He's doing a great job, so it's fine. Now Scotty is going to play through the same amp with the same settings just to kind of show you how the player can impact the tone of the amp. Same guitar, same amp. <laughs> I think it, uh, it basically illustrates how just because you've got the same amp and the same guitar, same settings, you can still get a completely different tone out of it. So obviously the search for the perfect tone involves a lot more than just an amp. It's also the guitar, the player, the pick, you know, how hard he hits the strings, how he frets it, whether he shakes it a little bit after he plays a note. There's a lot more to it than just 
uh, whether you use EL34s or 6L6s. Okay? Cool. That was perfect. It may even be something that they just cut in every now and then. Yeah. Well, I had a next door neighbor that knew how to tune a guitar. That was really helpful. Standard tuning. Uh, and I think I learned a couple of chords from him. Then I fell off a skateboard, broke my thumb, went to another kid a little farther down the block who knew how to do bar chords because <laughs> I couldn't use my thumb anymore, my little hands. Uh, just played with other players, took some jazz lessons for a year from a, a guy named Rodney, Rodney Stephenson, who I, I fell off the face of the earth, but was a fantastic uh, guitarist in Toledo. Um, just picked the brains of guitar players and played along with records. You know, I, I went to college for a short while and really all I did was play along with records. Tried to play along with John McLaughlin and Jeff Beck on the records they were putting out. And never quite did it, but I think that's how I, I found my own style. I never really nailed anybody. I'm still learning. I, I, I'm still learning, and so much depends on what I'm using. Uh, you can use a different uh, distortion pedal, or or fake Leslie effect, or or amp modeling stuff in software, and it leads to a, a fresh idea. As far as achieving a variety of sounds, um, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a lot of uh, approaches, what we call modeling amps, and what these amps are is basically a way to simply rotate a knob and get a, di a completely different sound from the amp. What I prefer, most people when they play through an amp, they're, they like the basic tone that it has and by putting certain emphasis in certain places you can usually accomplish most of those other sounds just by pulling a bright switch, adjusting the tone controls a little bit. So I, what I try to do is make sure that there's combinations in there that work for any guitar and any playing style without having to resort to a complete overhaul of the tone.
quit. Whoa! Uh, that was great. Fantastic. I'm not used to standing or standing and playing, but I couldn't, oh, I couldn't get under it. Well, uh, I started out with a flat pick, and uh, my dad got me. He played flat pick. He uh, actually uh, played very good uh, boogie woogie style guitar out of World War II. He, he played this lick out of a boogie woogie song. So he played swing guitar type sound. Uh, he always liked the thumb style because his younger brother, my uncle, that I mentioned earlier, uh, played that style and kind of coaxed me into doing it uh, around the age of 14, 15. And, and, and I, I picked it up pretty quickly and, and uh, being that Chet was, we always heard Chet Atkins around the house. and So I got into doing that and basically, you know, growing up through the 60s, it was the rock stuff like a CCR, he had to play some of that stuff, which I liked it. And, uh, and then uh, fusing in the, the more jazz oriented stuff in the 70s uh, and everything from just playing three piece band stuff in the 70s, playing, you know, uh, classic rock stuff, playing country. Bars used to be to where you had to play everything there was just about, you know, from George Jones to uh, uh, play that funky music, you know, so to exist. There wasn't anybody selling the state, a, a straight diet of any style of music that I knew of. And toward the uh, early 80s, you began to hear a lot of stuff uh, recorded that sounded like it was multi-track a whole lot. So I kind of got into uh, doing that because when I do a session, I'd have to lay a track over it. And I thought, well, they got to be a better way of doing that. So I, I developed a, a technique of using my pick and my index finger by playing double stops and instead of having to claw them out. I mean, there's always been double stops and triple stops, but I mean, in this technique, you're playing it in one take. It's like a fluid type thing, you know? Type thing, so. Uh, I had to work on that for a while, and that, that was fused into my style in the early 80s, and that became something I used a whole lot on stage. Did you uh, take lessons to learn, or did you do it mostly by... No, just trial and error. Leaving a gig and getting home and say, thinking, well, how can I make that sound a little bit better? And just uh, sitting around and pulling it out of the walls, you know? There wasn't all the teaching... Uh, 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 systems out that there is now and easy access to learn stuff so just get on stage and trial and error you know the solid state versus tube question is kind of a trick question because basically there's there's plenty of tube amps that sound bad and plenty of solid state amps that sound good so it's really not as cut and dry as saying that but of course there are certain differences, and uh, I'll elaborate on those a little bit. Tube amps tend to have uh, a bunch of things about the design of the tube itself that create really what an engineer would consider to be an inferior design. Um, for instance, the sag thing we talked about in the uh, with the tube rectifiers, the fact that they don't clip symmetrically, the fact that they create uh, unusual harmonic content when you play through them. Um, there's a lot of phenomenon that happened with tubes that create problems for engineers. So of course in the 60s everybody loved seeing solid state develop so that they could get away from those problems. Unfortunately, guitar players got used to what tubes did, bad or good, that affected the tone and how dynamic the guitar amp sounds. Because um, that's basically what it is, is how can, I, how can I translate what I'm trying to put through the guitar and get it to the speaker in such a way that it not only reacts the way I do, but almost emphasizes or overemphasizes those, those things that I'm trying to get through the guitar. So it's kind of like the, the tubes actually are able to amplify the dynamics of the person's playing whereas solid state tends to not do that as well. Now, you can, you can design in these same flaws 
into a solid state circuit. It just takes a lot of effort and, and, and you have to understand what those various aspects are. One aspect that's, that's probably the most important is what we call low damping factor. And what that means is, is the uh, amp's ability to restrain the speaker from moving when you stop playing. That's basically the, the simple view of it. It's kind of like a bad shock absorber. If you hit a bump in a car with a bad shock, it bounces a couple more times after you, st after you hit that bump. If it was a solid state amp and you hit that bump, it would come back quickly and be solid after that. Well, when you play tube amps, you like the fact that, after, that there's a rebound to the sound. When you play, you hit it hard, you hear the speaker go whoop after the fact. And uh, it's just kind of a warmer sound because of that. Because it's doing things, you're getting free low end, basically. You know, I learned stuff from guys that didn't play guitar. I learned a lot when I was in high school and I was a hot shot 15 year old guitar player playing with older kids and I remember one of my older friends said, you know, Rob, hot guitar players are a dime a dozen. And it, it made me think, okay, well great, so I know how to play guitar, but why am I playing guitar? It made me think more about songs and compositions and uh, what exactly George Harrison was doing in those Beatles songs, getting those delicious sounds out of his AC-30s or Fenders and Gretches and Rickenbackers or whatever the heck he was using, thinking of it more in those ways. And of course, taking lessons from all the English greats, all those guys, I mean, listening to them, playing along with records. And uh, I got a lot of enlightenment from listening to guys that didn't play guitar. I've, I've thought sometimes Terry Adams, the um, keyboard player in NRBQ, might be my favorite guitar player because he plays these huge, uh, in a keyboard way, Townsend-esque chords and it's really simplifies and leaves and left big empty spaces. Uh, he would credit Thelonious Monk, but I, I think he was a fantastic uh, musician and I learned a lot about being a musician from him because I, I think you know guitars I, I want to be a musician more than a I want to be a, a good musician that that can help other people trip out and, and and have a religious experience the way I had it when I listened to those guys actually uh, I kind of got out of playing mainstream music in around uh, 93 I played like most styles the bar styles of, of music and the modern country stuff was interesting for a while until it all just, just sounded like one guy played everything that came out of there and the singers sound like they're trying to cry and they're eating and they get choked and, the, and they're trying to sing. And the songs are very trite so I, I got out of it, you know, and uh, yeah, and I just thought, well, you know, I, I want to play music but I, I'm just tired of this. So I just re kind of reinvented myself into playing standards but doing them the way I wanted to do them in a different uh, uh, energy level, I guess you would say, because people have played them all their life and they're probably tired of them. So it, they're, they're fairly new to me in a sense that I, I enjoy playing them. So that's the focus that I, that I play is a lot, of, a lot of standards, whether it be old country, old jazz. I like a lot of old jazz stuff before the big band era. Uh, I like a lot of big band stuff because I try to emulate the sounds on, on the guitar, but uh, just uh, I, I find myself not listening to that many guitar players because I bruise easy. You know what I mean? It's these guys scare me to death. So I'll listen to horn ensembles or, or uh, piano players or anything. You know, because I'm easily take a guy like George Benson. How can you not listen to George Benson after you grab your guitar? Want to sound like George Benson? You know, I mean, it's just. It's uh, contagious, you know, so I try to avoid it. Basically, we talk about solid state and tube. There's, there's good things and bad things about each technology. And uh, a hybrid system would try to use the best of the tube part and the best of the solid state part. In fact, we have a new series called the HV uh, amp series, which does just that. It's, uses a solid state power amp, so it's not real heavy. It does have an artificially low damping factor to sound like a tube power amp. 
And then we have a tube preamp with some solid state mixed. Uh, basically, to avoid the, the complications with the level controls between, I mean, with the levels between tube and solid state, we actually brought in some high voltage solid state parts, transistors that operate at the same voltages as the tubes. That way we don't have to shrink the signal down and crank it back up and shrink it down to go through tube preamps. I find that the tube preamp is ultimately more important than the power amp for creating the basic tone of the amp and most of the distortion that people like, especially nowadays, comes from preamp distortion. So this hybrid system uses that technique. I'm not used to standing or standing and playing, but yeah, I, I, I couldn't get under it. Yeah. <laughs> right now I got it. Uh, I'm going to roll. 